Can Russia be trusted? I put that question to Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg. Hi, Secretary General. Good to have you back on our program. I want to start with the news from President Zelensky that Ukraine is bracing for uh, increased attacks from Russia on the country's east. That despite Russia pledging to move away from Kyiv and Chernihiv. From your perspective, can Russia be trusted? No, Russia cannot be trusted. Uh, they have actually lied throughout this crisis and in the preparations for the crisis uh, when we saw the significant Russian military buildup uh, throughout the fall and the beginning of this year, they denied uh, absolutely that they had any plans whatsoever to invade Ukraine. Uh, so we cannot trust their words. We have to judge them by their actions. Uh, and what we see now is that they're not actually withdrawing troops. They are repositioning them uh, to reinforce their offensives in the Donbass uh, region. And this uh, just uh, demonstrates once again that they're pursuing a military outcome of this conflict. And, and they had said that they were going to change their military strategy in order to bolster good faith in negotiations that had been taking place between Ukrainian and Russian officials. Since that's not what they did, what does that mean for those negotiations? Can they ever be fruitful from your perspective? I think it's important to continue to uh, strive for a political uh, solution. And of course, we also know that there is a very close link between what's going on on the battlefield and uh, uh, what can uh, uh, be achieved uh, around the negotiating table. And that's the reason why NATO allies continue to provide uh, significant support to Ukraine. Uh, to help them defend themselves uh, and uh, the combination of uh, modern military equipment and the courage and the strength uh, uh, of the Ukrainian armed forces has actually uh, uh, proven extremely effective in, in resisting the invading uh, Russian uh, forces. Uh, uh, so, But we will continue to support efforts to find a political solution, but uh, knowing that uh, Russia cannot be trusted, knowing that we need to judge them by their actions, and then uh, also knowing that the stronger Ukraine is on the battlefield, the more likely it is that there will be an acceptable outcome at the negotiating table. I, I understand your point about the need for those discussions to take place, but considering Russia's actions to date, again, I guess my question is, is there any reason, have they given you any reason to believe a political solution is possible? So not so far, but uh, almost all conflicts ends uh, at the negotiating table. The question is when and also on what conditions. And therefore, we need to both provide support to Ukraine, impose uh, heavy costs on Russia, but of course also support efforts to find a, a political and negotiated solution, at least to, to have talks addressing the need for humanitarian corridors or the ceasefire. Uh, but most fundamentally, I trust President Zelensky, I trust the elected political authorities of Ukraine to, made, uh, to make the judgments on how to engage with Russia. Uh, sooner or later, there has to be some kind of negotiated uh, uh, agreement. Uh, uh, but of course, the outcome will totally depend on developments uh, on the uh, battlefield. Speaking of those developments, uh, there is uh, new intelligence from the United States that purports to show uh, what you had referenced, Ukraine's resistance, comes almost as a surprise to Vladimir Putin that his own defense officials have not been giving him the whole story about his own military's failures thus far. What does that tell you? I think it tells us uh, all something about the difference between um, autocracy uh, and democracy. Uh, Russia is a more and more autocratic society where uh, the advisors, the people are afraid of telling the truth, uh, speaking the truth uh, to, uh, to President Putin. They, they are inclined to, to tell the leaders exactly what they want to hear and, uh, and not uh, tell them uh, the realities on the ground. And of course, this uh, uh, is not the best basis for making uh, good decisions and the whole invasion of Ukraine uh, is a strategic uh, mistake by President uh, Putin. And we've also seen that the way they have been able to conduct this operation has uh, not been very successful. They totally underestimated the strength uh, of the Ukrainian armed forces. The Ukrainian armed forces is 
bigger, better trained, better equipped, uh, and better led now than ever before. Uh, partly also because of uh, support uh, delivered by Canada and all, all the NATO allies. Over many years, we have trained tens of thousands of Ukrainian troops and they are now uh, and, and equipped them, and they are now on the front line fighting against the invading Russian troops. And I don't think President Putin actually uh, totally realized the strength of the Ukrainian armed forces and the support they were going to receive from NATO allies uh, around the world. Putin and the Russians have also been, uh, you know, difficult is, is even putting it lightly when it comes to the establishment of humanitarian corridors. They have really uh, tried everything in their power to stop the establishment of those corridors, in particular in and out of Mariupol. Today, as we speak, there are efforts to resurrect one there, but the damage to that port city, I I'm sure you've seen the images, I know our viewers have, is just devastating. A few weeks ago, you said that there are credible reports of war crimes taking place in Ukraine. Do you believe Vladimir Putin is a war criminal? What we know is that uh, civilian infrastructure, schools, hospitals have uh, been uh, has been attacked. Uh, we know that uh, uh, residential areas have been attacked and many civilians have been uh, killed. Uh, and uh, and this is uh, uh, a deliberate attacks on civilians uh, uh, is uh, is a violation of international uh, law. Uh, therefore, I welcome also that the International Criminal Court has opened an investigation, and at the end, it has to be a, a judicial body like the International Criminal Court that makes the, the final decisions. But what we have seen is is uh, appalling and uh, and and a blatant violation of international law. Uh, respectfully, I take your point on all of that, Secretary General, but uh, that doesn't answer whether or not you think Vladimir Putin, as a consequence of everything you just laid out, is a war criminal. So he is responsible for the war, uh, and he is responsible for the military uh, operations. Uh, and therefore, it is also something that it is extremely important that we collect as much evidence and as much uh, information as possible. Uh, uh, so, so the body, the International Criminal Court, which is going to make the final judgments and decisions, have all the information and all the basis they, they need to make the final decisions on which individuals are responsible for which actions. Before I let you go, Secretary General, uh, this country, or my country, I should say, I'm in Poland right now, but my home country of Canada, it, the government in that country exactly one week from today is set to release its new budget. If that budget does not explicitly chart a path to 2% of GDP on defense spending, will Canada be letting the NATO alliance down? Canada has uh, already increased defence spending, and uh, I welcome that uh, President uh, Prime Minister Trudeau uh, has made it clear that uh, Canada will consider significantly further increases in defence spending. Uh, and uh, we also have to, or I also recognise the fact that Canada is contributing to NATO in many different ways. Uh, uh, Canada has been one of the lead nations in providing support to Ukraine for many, many years. Uh, Canada has uh, has the, the is leading one of the battle groups uh, NATO has in the eastern part of the alliance in Latvia. I met uh, both uh, Defence Minister Annan and uh, Prime Minister Trudeau there a few weeks ago, uh, and and Canada is now increasing its presence in the east uh, with a new frigate and with more troops uh, in the eastern part of the alliance. And then of course NATO allies uh, and NATO welcomes the fact that Canada has decided to invest in fifth generation aircraft. All of this demonstrates that Canada is a highly valued uh, and important uh, NATO ally contributing to our collective defence, shared uh, security in many different ways. So just very quickly, if that 2% target, as I said, is not laid out, a path to that target is not laid out, but all of the things that you just mentioned are happening, is that okay with you? Does that mean that the 2% target is not necessary to be in the budget? So NATO allies made an agreement in 2014 to increase uh, defence uh, spending and 2% is the guideline and, uh, and uh, this was reinforced or reiterated at our summit uh, last week here in Brussels because in light of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, of course, investing our security just becomes even more important. I expect all allies, including Canada, to make good on the promises we have uh, made and I welcome that uh, Canada has started to increase defence spending. Secretary General, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it as always. Thank you so much for having me.
I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.